Under the Egg, Chapter 17. While Goldie pursued her mysterious lead and Lydon plotted his warrant, Bodie and I had nothing to do but wait. We regrouped the next day in Jack's studio, guarding the painting while we sipped an iced tea, really just the leftover morning's tea served lukewarm in jelly jars. It was clear we were at a crossroads, but we didn't even know which direction the signs pointed. To wit, I launched in. To what? Bodie interrupted. To wit, I said. It means thusly. Bodie rolled her eyes. Oh, jeez. Just talk like a normal person for once and not like an 80-year-old and your old lady slip. Fine, okay, I said, crossing my arms over my grandmother's repurposed negligee, which I had thought made a nice sundress. Here's what we know. Anna Trancher is probably, let's face it, dead. Even if she survived the camp, it's not likely she survived the Paris executioner. And we know her parents are dead, and most likely all of her family members. We don't know that actually, mused Bodie. There could be some long-lost cousin out there. Yes, I admitted, but we won't find them without hiring an archivist, like Goldie said. True that, nodded Bodie. Okay, I'll stop talking like an old lady if you stop impersonating rap stars. Hip-hop artists, Bodie corrected. I gave her a look after which she said nothing but made an okay sign. We also know that the painting is stolen with no authentication or documentation, so I can't sell it. And if you can't find Anna, you can't return it. So what was the point? I clenched my jar of tea. Jack must have known that I had no chance of finding Anna Trancher. So why leave me this great big mystery? Why shouldn't I just give the stupid painting to Leiden? I don't know, Theo, said Bodie. Maybe you should. We sat with that sign on the crossroads, attempting to dismantle the mental roadblock that kept us from admitting defeat. Bodie finally spoke. There is one thing that Goldie said that's been bothering me. Just one? Okay, there were a lot of things that were mm, disturbing, but only one that doesn't make sense. The Nazi officer, he signed Anna out of camp, right? The Paris executioner? Seems so. Bodhi started pacing the room. Well, why? If he wanted her to die, he could have just left her there. He needed the painting. She had it. So? Bodhi stopped in front of me. He could have gone to the camp or sent some underling, for that matter, grabbed the painting, kicked her back inside. Slowly it dawned on me, but he signed her out. Exactly. I mean, if the executioner wanted to kill her, it would have been a lot easier to just leave her at the camp and let the system do the dirty work. So do you think he got her out to safety? Bodie spoke tentatively. I think maybe he did. And maybe. I was interrupted by a banging on the front door that carried all the way up the stairs, the kind of insistent banging that only produced by a fist. Bodie and I ran to the small front window of Jack's studio that overlooked the street where a squad car was double parked. Below on the stoop stood at least three men in police uniforms, plus an older man in a seersucker suit. I knew in that instant that whatever happened to the painting, it was not going to leave this house by force, not this way. I turned to Bodie. Do you think we can wait them out? I remember Leiden's last threats. They probably have a warrant. Bodie shook her head. Mm, I don't know. My dad has been in a couple of cop movies and I think they can bust their way in if they have a warrant. I started moving paintings around the studio looking for a hiding place. They're going to search the whole house, you know, said Bodie. I stopped with my arms full of unfinished canvases. I know. What about behind the house, in the chicken coop? That's not a bad idea. I looked out the front window again, but they'll see us coming down the stairs through the glass on the front door. What about the basement? Still have to go down the front stairs. Theo, Theo, are you up there? There's someone at the door. My mom's re voice floated through the house. Shh, mom, I hissed. I'll be down in a minute. Turning back to Bodie, I said, we've got to find somewhere to stash this before. Lyme's muffled voice drifted through the door and all the way up the staircase. Theodora, we know you're in there. I have a warrant here, and these police officers have every right to break your door down if you don't open it of your own accord. Be a good girl now. Before that, I finished. Bodie furrowed her brow. Don't you have any secret rooms or passageways or something in this old house? One dim 30 watt light bulb went off in my brain. It's a risk, I muttered, but she would be at the shop now and I could get it back before she gets home. I thrust the painting into Bodie's arms and headed down the stairs to the second floor, calling over my shoulder. Wait at the top of the stairs. I've got to talk to my mom. My mom was hovering on the second floor landing in her bathrobe. Theo, aren't you going to answer it? She looked worried. They seem impatient. 
Mom, look me in the eyes. She made a few efforts, her eyes finally landing on my shoulder. Close enough. Mom, I need you to do something very important. That's Lydon Randolph downstairs with some friends of his. They are coming to see me, but I'm not ready for them yet. I need you to make them some tea. Tea? She blinked rapidly. Why me? Because I have to get something ready for them, and you're the only one I can trust to know the right kind of tea to serve. My mom looked momentarily confused and proud. Lydon and his friends? Well, what kind of friends? Police officers. She stood up a bit taller. Oh, well, that's easy. Something strong and bracing. Lap sang Sushong. I could do that, I suppose. She wrapped her bathrobe around her tighter, and the kettle is on the stove. And the lap sang on the windowsill in the yellow tin. I pushed her in the direction of the stairs. Oh, and they are really interested in, what's that thing you're working on? For Matt's last theorem? Yes, that's why they're here, to hear about that. As my mother tripped downstairs like a girl with the gentleman collar, I waved Bodie and the painting down to the second floor and pulled her into Jack's old bedroom. We closed his door just as I heard my mother greeting Lydon and his merry band. Jack's scent had faded, but at that moment it felt overwhelming. Paint, turpentine, old spice, the smoke of his one Saturday night cigarette. The furniture was just as he'd left it, too. A grand Victorian bedroom set made up with Spartan army blankets. It occurred to me for the very first time that they were military issue brought home from the war. How much time can your mom really buy us? asked Bodie. They won't start here. They'll start poking around downstairs or go right to the studio. We only need five minutes, but they'll look in here eventually. Yes, I agreed, but they won't look in here. I gestured dramatically to the heavy armoire that dominated Jack's room. Of course they'll look in there. They'll search every closet. Bodie shook her head. What's wrong with you? No, not in there. I braced my back against the side of the armoire. Listen, just put the painting down and grab hold of the other side and help me move this as quietly as you can. The armoire weighed twice as much as any other piece of furniture in the house, but we managed to slide it along the floor an inch at a time, hoping the groans and creaks would be lost in the confused conversations I heard downstairs. As predicted, the combination of Mom's meandering thoughts and Lydon's attempts to appear chivalrous in front of the cops was buying us the time we needed. Finally, the armoire had been heaved aside, revealing the door that led directly into 20 Spinney Lane, home of Madame Dumont and brief dwelling place of the first Grandmama Tenpenny. I said a silent prayer that Madame Dumont was indeed at the shop, turned the knob and pushed my shoulder against the door, it flew open with a surprising ease, and I tumbled on the floor after it. No Madame Dumont here. I was surrounded by blackness and the smell of mothballs, a jungle of hanging fabric and plastic wrap entangling me from all sides. It turns out Jack didn't have to worry about a lurking Madame Dumont all those years. She or some earlier occupant had built a closet in front of the door. Are you okay? asked Bodie, her head haloed by the light of Jack's room. I swatted away something woolen. Yes, fine. Give me the painting. Bodie stepped into the dark closet and placed the painting in my arms. Better hurry, I just heard them heading up to the studio. I left the painting right there on the floor and hopped back into Jack's room where we reversed the moving process and planted the armor right back where we found it. By the time Lydon and his men had finished ransacking the rest of the house, Bodie and I were sitting in the parlor with my mother drinking lapsing Sushong and listening to her rattle on about whoever's last theorem. Find anything good? Bodie inquired sweetly as the men re-enter the parlor, wiping their foreheads on their shirt sleeves. Lydon's tired face reminded me of an old cartoon character who always complained about those meddling kids. Despite an incriminating amount of noise and disruption from your upper floors, no, we did not. He loosened his tie. Care to tell us anything, girls? Mm, not really, I said, sipping my tea. He turned to the officers who looked hot and bored. It's clear they have it. Somewhere in this house, maybe in the walls or some hidden entrance. We need to get some kind of equipment to open up the walls or one of those detectors that locate hollow spots or the cops exchanged glances that said that this job was not going to get them any closer to making detective. The most senior looking one spoke up. That's going to require a different kind of warrant than the one you got, sir. What? Why? My good friend, Harry, Judge Harold Greenbaum, to you, said all the paperwork was in order. Mr. Randolph, I think we better take this outside. Lydon drew up his shoulders. Yes, I think we'd better. 
My mother watched the men go, shaking her head. Dooby dooby doo, where are you? We got some work to do now. Scooby dooby doo, where are you? We need some help from you now. They didn't seem to know much at all about algebraic number theory, she said, and shuffled her way back to the room. As soon as she left, Bodie turned to me, her eyes ablaze. Upstairs and quick. We tiptoed past the front door and up the stairs. The men, too immersed in their debate to notice us, back up to Jack's room. Do you have a fire escape? asked Bodie. Sure, but it just leads out to the backyard, and there isn't any way to get out of the yard again. What about the roof? Couldn't you climb up to the roof from the fire escape outside Jack's studio? Maybe, but not with a painting under my arm. Then I'll climb up. You hand me the painting. Then I'll walk over the rooftops to my house, slip our bodyguard $20, well, maybe $15, not to tell my parents, and climb down my own fire escape, like Robert De Niro and Godfather too. You guys have bodyguards on your roof? Focus here, Theo. She wrapped me on the skull. We've got to move that armoire again. Somehow the armoire had gotten heavier since we left. We inched it aside with even less finesse than before certain that with every scrape that the police would somehow hear us and track the noises to Jack's room. With not a second to spare, I burst through the connecting door again, but this time a light beckoned me at the other end of the closet where I saw Madame Dumont sunken to the floor, the cardigan she'd come back for forgotten, my very own painting held in her arms while tears streamed down her face. <laughs>